and welcome. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to All About the Ancient Worlds. So it's been a little over a year since we started All About the Ancient Worlds, and we just wanted to introduce ourselves a little bit more and give everyone a chance to hear more about us, more about the project, um, and kind of why we started this and why we think it's important. So I'm Emily Prosh. Um, my background uh, is mostly in classics, so I did uh, classics with an emphasis in archaeology, um, both for my undergrad at Carthage College uh, and for my master's with the University of Arizona. And I'm currently a PhD candidate uh, in art history and archaeology at the University of Missouri. For fieldwork and museum experience, um, I have about nine years of field experience. As an undergrad, I worked at uh, Horvat Omri, which is a Roman temple site in northern Israel. And then the rest of my projects have been in Greece. So that included uh, the Mount McCann excavation and survey project, um, briefly being a supervisor at Corinth, and then mostly with the Agora excavations at, um, in Athens with the American School of Classical Studies. So I'm Christine Mountson. I got my BA from Denison University in Classics and an MA from Texas Tech University in Classics with an emphasis in archeology. span and I just finished my PhD in art history and archaeology at the University of Missouri this past summer. In terms of field work, I've been working in Greece since about 2012. I first worked on the island of Crete at the Project Azoria. And more recently, I've been involved with the Salida Naxos archaeological project since 2016, which was the focus of my dissertation. And I'm a pottery specialist for the team. I also have some museum experience. I worked at my undergrad in museums for three years in collections and was a curatorial intern at the Toledo Museum for two summers under the ancient art curator. And more recently, I've been getting more involved in public art nonprofit in Mid-Missouri and in a, on an advisory board for a local art gallery. So my name is Miranda Lovett. Um, my education background is um, a BA in classical archaeology from the University of Mary Washington and an MA in classical archaeology from the University of Arizona. Um, both of my fieldwork experiences were in Greece. Um, so I did field school at an excavation on a tiny island called Despotico. And um, I was also a lab team member at the Mount Lycaon excavation. Um, and I had a public programs internship at the Getty Villa Museum in Los Angeles. Hi, I'm Sierra Ciano. I also have a very classics heavy background. I got my BA in classical civilizations from UC Berkeley. I did a post bac in classical languages from UC Davis and then got my master's in classical antiquity from um, CU Boulder. I did a field school through UC Berkeley in Nemea, and then I excavated for three summers at the Athenian Agora excavations. Most recently, I also did a graduate internship at the Getty Museum in LA um, with the Antiquities Curatorial Department at the Villa, and now I'm a mobile educator at LACMA. So now that we've all introduced ourselves, um, next we're going to just briefly talk about how we met, uh, our goals for the project, um, frequently asked questions that we get, and also why we think it's important and how we all got into uh, our own interests in the ancient world. Uh, so when I started with the idea for All About the Ancient World, I knew I couldn't do it myself, so I wanted to pull together a team of people that um, I thought would also be interested in this kind of project. Uh, so Christine, uh, as she introduced herself, uh, we were also, we were both in the same program at University of Missouri for art history and archaeology. Um, and then I knew Sierra through the Agora. We both worked at the Agora excavations. And then Sierra knew Miranda um, through their internship at the Getty. So the idea of All About the Ancient World kind of came about during COVID. We saw a lot of online lecture series, a lot of conferences go fully online, and we saw how more accessible academic lectures could be using an online platform. And so the goal of All About the Ancient World was to bring, you know, traditional academic lectures more to the public through a more easily accessible, you know, narration of more complicated subjects by showcasing graduate students and early career researchers. 
Um, and to add on to what Christine was saying, we also really emphasize having um, a list of resources whenever uh, presenters submit an abstract so that it's you know a, a well-researched, well-documented um, uh, topic, even if it's you know off the beaten path so that we have um, legitimate research that we're, we're presenting. COVID really limited the ability for graduate students, especially young, maybe not young, because we not always age, but earlier career graduate students from being able to go to conferences, see what they might look like and ha learn how to present. Because mm -hmm. um, that was something that was so important for me during my master's. Like I went to the AIH for the first year and I saw what it, what those are supposed to be like. Yeah, and why we're so invested in like outlining the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For some people who have presented with us, it's their first time doing anything like this. Um, and it's a good skill to like know how to record your own videos and present your information on a, a virtual platform. Like I could see like virtual um, conferences or even hybrid ones continuing. Um, so it's good for people to get that experience um, in a nice like um, maybe welcoming environment and not just like because <laughs> you know like in-person conferences can be like really intense um, so it's also just nice to kind of ease into it with a virtual lecture. We're also invested in this because we've all um, either personally or some of our alma maters have all experienced cuts, um, whether it's to classics or other uh, smaller humanities programs. Um, so we're really interested in gaining public interest in these kinds of topics and seeing what graduate students and what early career researchers do in these fields. I think also just coming from a classics background, I feel like my understanding of the ancient world was pretty limited. Um, just for my education alone. So being part of a, a platform where we really encourage people from all kinds of ancient studies programs to present has been um, exciting for me, but I think it's just exciting in general to see, um, you know, other ancient cultures being highlighted. Because um, as much as I love Greece and Rome, like they've kind of had the floor for the past however many hundred years. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're hoping that this can be interdisciplinary. Um, Mm -hmm. And really, just because you can, you know, talk about weaving in ancient Greece, I mean, weaving is pretty universal. So we're hoping to draw in more interdisciplinary backgrounds, too. Yeah, I was going to add on to that and say that so often, right, with, with these disciplines, they do get put in little boxes. So I think having that interdisciplinary approach is something that we really prioritize because we want to see how the ancient world is connected and people making cross-cultural, um, you know, points of um, continuity. And... Also just thinking that sometimes uh, grad students and ECRs can kind of struggle to think how their research or their interests might fit into say a panel being presented at a conference. So we wanted to have that flexibility so people could present on research that maybe is a little bit, like you said, off the beaten path, um, a little unusual or not as mainstream in academia. The other great thing about having this being this ongoing lecture series that's not necessarily tied to one specific time of the year or on one specific limited platform where you have to pay to register or sign up some way having it on our having these lectures on our website and on our youtube channel is something that is very accessible and open to the public so we really wanted to put the emphasis on developing the skills not just to talk to other experts but to talk to people who are specifically not specialists just a general public who may have an interest in this but not really know how to get a foothold in the door to to, to engage with that kind of conversation i think it's it's pretty flexible um right now because we have sort of a heavily classics and kind of near eastern and egypt um sphere going at the moment. It's really been sort of pre-medieval. Um, we've done a little bit with reception uh, as well as long as something is, is rooted um, in the ancient world. But I think for globally that can be a lot more flexible uh, and it's really going to depend on the researcher um, and what they're looking at. Uh, but it's there's not really a specific time period that applies worldwide. Yeah, it's not like we have a specific date cut off, like must be before 1000 CE or anything. Right, like that. right. Because we know that what people consider ancient or antiquity can de change depending on the field you're in or the type of, you know, the geographical region you're studying. So, yeah, which culture you're looking at. Yeah.
Well, we're all volunteers. <laughs> um, we do this out of our, our love for antiquity and, and supporting early career researchers. We are all full-time workers and uh, students, so the amount of time we can put into it, it really is kind of a passion project. We did recently win Ancient Worlds Modern Communities mini grant from the Society of Classical Studies earlier in 2022. We've been putting these funds towards operation costs, like compensating the artists who designed our logo, promoting our call for papers post on social media so we get a wider audience, and applying to be a recognized nonprofit organization in the state of Missouri. Uh, not related to funding, but we're also partnered with the Save Ancient Studies Alliance, so you can find us on their um, dashboard for projects dealing with the ancient world. So early career researchers can include anyone enrolled in a graduate program, whether that's a MA, a Master of Philosophy, Master of Science, PhD. Uh, we just want people with a variety of expertise who have um, spent a significant amount of time researching in their field. We also accept presenters who have graduated from a grad program in the past three years. So just anyone who is you know, well-versed in their field and up to date with the latest research. The goal is to have presenters who produce high quality research, but that are applicable to the public as well. And so we want everyone to be able to communicate their ideas to a general audience. And that's a skill that you don't really learn in graduate school. And I think it's just so important, especially, you know, highlighting the importance of humanities or the ancient world in general. It's something that we're really striving for and we're hoping that more students and more early career researchers just start to understand why that's an important skill to have. We're looking for people that are excited about their work. Um, you know, a lot of people might think conferences can be boring and there's certainly sometimes boring conference papers, but we're really interested in people that are excited about their topics. Maybe it's um, something that's really niche that you can't really turn into a larger topic, but you just think is really neat. Um, so we're looking for things like that. And we're just, we want to see that you're excited and that will make other people excited as well. And this is also very much a peer reviewed process. So like never before have I, you know, sent an abstract into a conference, gotten it accepted and been able to get peer reviewed on my presentation before I stand up in front of an audience and get feedback. And so learning like getting that peer reviewed feedback is really helpful and it's it allows students and early career researchers to just kind of learn what's expected of the field. So we all have experience conferencing, so we know what it's like to be up there in front of an audience and not know how it, how your paper is going to be received. Yeah, and especially if depending on your program or, or what your experience is, um, maybe no one's told you how that your conference paper should be scripted um, if you're going to present professionally, at least in our experiences, um, that's usually the case, especially for a timed presentation. And also, you know, how to make good slides, what should be on your slides, um, things like that, how to define things and make it accessible to a public audience. Yeah, this is the kind of feedback that we're really striving to give our presenters after, you know, we have the first submit your abstract and then if it's accepted, then you submit what we've called preliminary documents. And that can be both your slideshow and a kind of a script. And so we can review that, as you said, give peer review. So give feedback on maybe should include more images or maybe a little too text heavy. Oh, try this kind of contrast. It might not be as easy to see or with the script, we can then point out things like, oh, you might want to focus more on this topic a little bit. That's the kind of training and support that we're really aspiring to give to our presenters and not just as we've said at some conferences you do feel a little bit like you've just been thrown into the deep end right so and especially since making a video lecture is something that is a very new and unusual skill that you probably will not get training on in a graduate program so that's why we want to make sure that we're being giving that extra level of support to our presenters. yeah and all of that is is outlined pretty thoroughly on our websites because we just we want to be really transparent um, so you should know exactly what you're getting into and what to expect in terms of feedback and how that process works. We also recognize is having, especially say with Miranda and I, be doing these kind of graduate internships, that sometimes 
being in these kind of programs can kind of stretch on. You're almost in a little limbo of like, am I a grad student or am I something else, right? So that's why we're also opening this up to if you're doing kind of, you know, a one-year fellowship or an internship at, say, like a museum or a lab or some other kind of research institution, we you know that kind of adds on to the clock a little bit. Like, we definitely want to hear from you as well. And we think that that can bring in a lot of unique perspectives. We all know grad school is a very busy time. Um, so it gives you a little <laughs> bit of flexibility to either apply while you're a student, um, maybe it's based on a term paper or something, and then have some flexibility afterwards too, if you're like, hey, I really want to present this project and I never got a chance um, when you can still offer that to you. If you're doing some kind of something that's considered like alternative to academia, right? But you're still involved in research and what you're doing may still allow you to have the time to research, then you're still a researcher. And if you're early in your career, we are still interested in hearing from you. So yeah, that's why we have our, like a little bit of flexibility. If you are say in something that's, you know, in a post back program, it's not really a graduate program, but you know, you're still post your um, bachelor's or if you, you know, might be just outside of that three year cutoff, we kind of take those things on a case by case basis. So if you have an idea you're really passionate about, we still definitely want to hear from you. Personally, I was definitely one of those kids who in middle school picked up Percy Jackson and was reading that alongside a bunch of, you know, more scholarly mythology material in class, although it was for sixth and seventh graders. <laughs> oh, you know, but I really found it um, really fun to compare, you know, what was being told to me is like, oh, this is canonical. And then what was clearly an adaptation and kind of comparing those and saying, well, why did this author make these changes? So I think that is part of what has borne my interest in this kind of the perception of the ancient world, what do we know of how it really was, and then how do people present it today? In terms of reception, there's all kinds of reception, right? But I really do like the kind of pop culture, almost like online fandom type reception of the ancient world, which hopefully is something I'll be able to research more about in the future and will become <laughs> a little bit less niche in the field in the future going forward. Uh, mythology also was kind of what piqued my interest originally. It was like part of our required reading for um, high school freshman English. <laughs> um, but I had just, I'd never been introduced to that world before. So just like learning about um, like Odysseus and um, Narcissus and just all of these myths that I'd never heard, it was fascinating. And, and so when I got to college and saw that classics was a major, I was like, oh, okay, like I can, I can study this and maybe make a career out of it. Um, but once I started taking art history classes, I think that's kind of where I really realized like this is the area that I wanted to stick to. Um, and that's how I got specifically into, into the archeological side of classics. For me, it was history. So in middle school, I loved history. Um, I think it was seventh grade is when we first started learning about the ancient world. Remember we were learning about the Egyptians and. I just was completely drawn to that. And then in high school, I got more exposed to what archeologists did. Um, so I went to undergrad knowing I wanted to do archeology, span but I actually, actually thought I was gonna go more anthropology, but I enrolled in ancient Greek my first semester and I fell in love with the language. And I just, I remember <laughs> I met with my undergraduate advisor and she was like, well, you, you know, you can do ancient Greek archaeology if you really love ancient Greek and I was like oh well that seems kind of cool like I can go to Greece and you know, work on projects and after my second year of my undergrad I went to Greece for the first time I worked on my ex first excavation and it was an early Iron Age site and that kind of sparked my interest and I started falling in love with older Greek history much to the dismay of my undergraduate advisor <laughs> um, I knew I was going to go prehistory and that's what I kind of focused in on and I find prehistoric archaeology incredibly interesting and sometimes overlooked within the field of classics because I feel like I'm kind of like an outlier in that regard but I just find it fascinating and come like that combined with my love of museums and public art has just kind of really shaped my career. So I think my favorite topics in high school, I took Latin all four years of high school, um, and I think that with history were my favorite subjects. And to me that combined to make archeology. span um, So I actually like intentionally picked 
an undergrad school that, that had a classical archaeology major. Um, so I went in knowing I wanted to do that. Uh, and I was lucky. I felt a little silly declaring archaeology when I didn't have any archaeology experience as a high schooler. Um, but I, I had a very encouraging uh, science professor, actually, who was like, well, look into it and you know, like, go for it. Um, so I was lucky in that regard. And then I think because I took Latin, I was a little bit more familiar with um, classics. Uh, yeah, so I went in and then much like Christine, I think my first excavation was really what cemented it for me. And that was a, a Roman excavation. And I sort of ended up, um, you know, coming coming to the Greek side. But uh, <laughs> yeah, there's it's hard to beat, you know, pulling pulling stuff out of the ground that hasn't seen the light of day in 2000 years. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, my first excavation, one of the first things I really, I excavated personally was a iron dagger. And I was like, this is just so cool, you know, finding something that's thousands of years old. And I'm the first person to, you know, see it in those many years. I went back to school and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your first excavation find? I think mine, it was like a, it was a small Arevalos. It was fully intact. Um, and I think it was like the first day and like, Nobody in the other trenches had been finding anything. Like it was just dirt, <laughs> just like <laughs> shovels of, of dirt. Um, and, but we got the lucky trench. Um, and yeah, I actually like when I first saw it, I asked the professor who was with us to pull it out because I was so nervous. And she was like, oh, yeah. "Did you come all the way to Greece for me to pull it out?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "You're right, you're right." <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what, but that's yeah, like a little I mean, perfume vessel, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But no, it's exactly what you said, Christine, just like that experience of knowing no one else has touched that in so long. Like, I don't know. It's I think that's what archaeologists wake up for. Mm -hmm. I think for me, there was one time in the at the Agora in Athens when we were picking apart kind of like a medieval wall and we knew that there was going to be marble in it because we could see from the outside but we had to go through very carefully layer by layer of course and when we got to these larger marble chunks everyone was being like be really careful look at these all over because you never know if it could be like a sculpture bit or you know look for tool marks kind of thing and so sure enough we take out this big chunk of marble and it's covered in dirt I'm flipping it over and like Bam, flat side with text, like inscription. And that was just so exciting. And also to think about how, like the journey that this object must have taken, right? To go from, you know, coming from a quarry, being carved, having this original life or whatever it was intended, and then eventually being broken, put into this wall by later people and how they were using it in a way that was meaningful to them, right? And then us now unearthing it and eventually it'll probably end up in a storeroom or in a museum, somewhere, <laughs> depending on how it goes. But then like what we can learn from it today. I just really love knowing, like focusing on these objects and the kind of history and how they, how they're affected by, you know, human lives and stuff like that across. It's just really fun. Yeah, I think my first artifact I found was a, a spindle whirl. So it's just like a little, little tiny circular thing. And I had no idea what a spindle whirl was um, at the time. <laughs> so someone had to explain to me, you know, the process of, of turning wool into, um, thread and yarn and how how the weaving process works um i thought that was really interesting how something small can tie into you know, a much larger process and that's just an object of daily life too and you never know what's going to happen when you go to site mm -hmm. like in 2019 on my site we like one day i was just doing test trenches like one by one meter test trenches my first test trench land, uh, ended after literally a day of digging I got it was 10 centimeters deep and then this one day I was up there with my you know my assistants and we're just uncovering loads of pottery and then we find out it's a bronze age sanctuary site and it's just you know it was totally unexpected um, <laughs> yeah like that like those discoveries you know that's why you're why we do these things and you know you get a walk away and be like oh wow like I was a part of that and that's just so cool <laughs> So clearly you can see we all have classics and especially archaeology backgrounds and we get really excited about archaeology. Um, but that is part of the goal of All About the Ancient World is to really expand beyond um, the classics framework. So just because that's our background, um, we, we would love to get more submissions from beyond the Mediterranean and from different time periods. Mm -hmm.
Well, we hope you enjoyed getting to know us all a bit better. If you have any other questions, we would love to hear from you. You can either leave a comment in this video or contact us on our website, which is linked in the description below. If this has sounded interesting to you and you would like to apply, please again check out our website. Our call for papers is posted there and our submission form is all listed uh, in the description below. We do have more lectures that are in the process of being made right now and we will be presenting them in the next couple months. So if you like what you see, um, please check out our YouTube channel, watch the other videos we've put up so far, um, hit the notification bell to get updates, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Thanks for watching and we hope you'll join us again here at All About the Ancient World. Bye! Bye. <laughs>